uh, so I want to paint a picture for you, if I may. Um, okay, the year is uh, 2006. It's the end of September. And uh, I am in the passenger seat of uh, my, uh, my friend Pete's maroon Chevy Lumina. And we are driving to Shakespeare as Catholic, the, my first ever Rochester Chesterton conference. Right? Yeah, yeah. Here, here. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, we're, we're uh, listening to Bollywood um, on, the, uh, on, on, on Pete's uh, iPod mini. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, we're talking about a diplomacy game that we've got going um, because we love board games. And uh, I have just come into the church, just come into the church, the Pentecost before, um, from uh, Anglicanism, before that Episcopalianism. And uh, uh, Pimatola, a year ahead of me at, uh, at RIT in the Information uh, Technology Program. And a seasoned veteran in the Catholic faith, having come in the year before at Michaelmas <laughs> from Methodism. And, uh, and then a, another song comes on. It's past the Shirley Temple. It says, I, I, I just have to sing one this. All right? Did this, did this happen? Did this really happen? It's a composite. <laughs> like they did in, uh, they, they, they do in the New York Magazine, right? To think that I would be here introducing Father Peter Matola at a Chesterton conference is just, it's just astonishing, is mind boggling. Father Peter, um, the thing you have to know about Father Peter is that he plays his, his life like a board game. Um, he loves the game, so, you know, diplomacy to, um, what's, what's that German one? With the Catan to all of these things. His life is a board game and the way you win is by getting grace to the people. This man was the most creative priest in Rochester for getting the sacraments to the people during the lockdown. While he was uh, studying for the priesthood at uh, Theological College in Washington, D.C., uh, Father Peter looked at, he looked at the rules of the game, and he said, how many degrees can I get out of this place? <laughs> and so he, you know, they give you, the one that they give you is, um, uh, and I think you might actually have to do a little bit of extra work or just be creative to get it, you've got an MDiv. Uh, you also get an ST. <coughs> Um, but he said, but all, the, all of these extra gen ed classes, if I arrange it just so, and then take a few online courses from the University of Toronto after I graduate, I can have an MA in medieval studies, which he did. And because he found in the Middle Ages, in uh, the Catholicism of the Middle Ages, a devotion to Jesus Christ that spoke to his heart. And so uh, it is my unbelievable honor to, uh, to introduce this talk, which is which is from the heart of my friend Father Peter Matol. In our first talk today, we heard about how it was that England became Catholic, and of even greater interest to me, but it's very very closely related. A second question that I hope to explore. How did Catholicism become English? That question makes sense, right? That as the faith spreads and people embrace it, it takes on a particular character, right? There are certain resonances with every human heart, and, and so the faith expresses itself in a particular way in each place where the faith takes root. And so how is it that the Catholic faith manifests itself in a peculiarly English way? I'll take as the statement of my, uh, my thesis today, a phrase from Dom Gregory Dix, the great Anglican Benedictine liturgical scholar from his 1945 landmark work, The Shape of the Liturgy. He says this, the liturgy expresses and must express something of the life of the Christian peoples. Their natural characteristics do to a large extent enter into their religious life to be supernaturalized by grace. 
the perfervid devotionalism of the Syrian, which comes out so strongly, for example, of St. Ignatius of Antioch, and for that matter, in Saul of Tarsus, and some of the Old Testament prophets. The ceremoniousness of the Byzantine, with his love of etiquette. The naivete of the Copt, and his love of repetitions. The French mutability, and love of some new thing. That special tenderness of English devotion, which manifests itself in a love of rather sentimental hymns and vocal prayers in the first Anglo-Saxon private prayer books that we have. The prosaic practicality and the almost stuffy conservatism of the local church of Rome. These things do not change from century to century, and they are not annihilated when men come to pray. A special tenderness of English devotion I think that's a theme that we, we find when we look at Catholic writings throughout the centuries, this tenderness, and especially in the sentimental hymns, the poetry of the English language. Certainly there's poetry in every language, but this tenderness, I hope to illustrate by some examples today. There is English language religious poetry going way, way back. So far back that, as I think you'll see in a, a few of my slides, so far back you wouldn't be able to recognize the language as English, or at least without special study couldn't make heads or tails of some of it. Uh, but as the language evolves, the existence of this, this poetry uh, we find in each century. I have here uh, a, a manuscript from the mid-11th century, just to, as an illustration of this. So we have a hymn from the breviary, Eterna Rex Altissime, and interlinear English translation with the Latin. Um, actually, you all know a bit of Middle English. Okay, watch this. Okay, so um, you remember you remember from studying the Declaration of Independence. If you, you know, looked at like pictures and you know those uh, 1700s document, right? The, 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 the long line that looks like an F but's missing its bar, that's an S, right? Okay, so uh, this character here makes an S sound, right? M-O-R-S, mores, mores. Uh, that's the Latin word for death. And look above it, D-E-A-D, -E dead. <laughs> <laughs> so look, you can read both the Latin and the Middle English, right? You're all budding Middle English scholars, and so today's lecture will be uh, accessible to you, I hope, I hope. <laughs> As we enter into a consideration of poetry, hymns in particular, <coughs> the namesake of our conference, G.K. Chesterton, has uh, something to say about the relationship of religion and rhyme in Fancies versus Fads, Chesterton says about rhyme. One purpose for which this pointed and definite form is very much fitted is the expression of dogma, as distinct from doubt or even opinion. This is why, with all allowance for a decline in the most classical effects of the classical tongue, the rhymed Latin of the medieval hymns does express what it had to express in a very poignant, poetical manner, as compared with the reverent agnosticism so nobly uttered in the rolling, unrhymed meters of the ancients. For even if we regard the matter of the medieval verses as a dream, it was at least a vivid dream, a dream full of faces, a dream of love and of lost things. It's the old story. It's love that makes the world go round. And all roads lead to Rome. We might almost say that all roads lead to rhyme. My talk will explore this special tenderness of English devotion by examining the roads that led to rhyme in a number of English language hymns and poems throughout the centuries. I do not expect that my talk will give us 
a grasp on a historical narrative. It's not really what I'm setting out to do. Uh, but rather, like a bee going from flower to flower, we're just going to enjoy the nectar that we can drink in from a few different, uh, more or less unrelated examples. But I hope that the passages we're about to consider will lift our minds and hearts to God. That having been said, I do want to make two caveats about my presentation. Um, first is that I will not be pronouncing things correctly. So if there are any real Middle English scholars, old English scholars, you know, um, who are you know, watching this presentation years later, I, I know, and I'm sorry for what I'm about to do in the language you say. Uh, but I hope that uh, the way I present some of these texts will, will, will make them understandable to our modern English-speaking sensibilities, our ears, and, uh, and, and capture the meaning, which is the important part. And the second caveat is that uh, my presentation, although it is largely about hymns, which are musical in nature, uh, I will not be speaking about musicology. Uh, the way that hymns are sung is of great interest, and much ink was spilled over it in the Middle Ages uh, as, as the forms of song evolve. Um, and we will have one example of uh, a, a musical presentation of a text that was sung to music, but it will not be in a historical musical style but rather a modern setting of a medieval text. In 1913, a young J.R.R. Tolkien said of his having read some old English poetry, quote, I felt a curious thrill, as if something had stirred in me half wakened by sleep. There was something very remote and strange and beautiful behind those words, if I could grasp it, far beyond ancient English." Unquote. It is my hope that we might experience today something along these lines. And so uh, I would now like to invite forward a longtime friend of the Chesterton Conference, Kurt Griffin, to sing for us. Uh, this text, this very text that you see here from a manuscript from about 1400, uh, the hymn Adam Le Ebounded. Adam Le Ebounded, bounden in a bond, four thousand winter, though he not too long. And all was for an apple, an apple that he took as clerk as find and written in their book. <clears throat> Nay, had one apple taken been the apple taken been, Nay, had never lady up in heaven's queen. Blessed be the time that apple taken was. Therefore we more sing in Deo gratias. Can't talk about hymns without singing a little. <laughs> so this is a, a, a great example of something you might have heard in church in the Middle Ages in England. And uh, so let's talk about the words and what they mean. You can, you can, you can get the sense of much of it, right, being a speaker of English. Adam lay abounded. Right, Adam. Now where is Adam laying? This is a meditation on... Sheol, the, the, the place of the dead, the underworld before the redemption by Christ. He, he is bound in a bond. He is shackled. He is trapped there. 4,000 winter thought he not too long. And he's been there thousands of winters, right? A great English <laughs> image of the misery. <laughs> of being without redemption right? in this cold place. 4,000 winters, but although he was in this cold, dark place for so long, it was not too long. It was not too great a punishment for Adam for what he had done. And we, we know what it is that he did. 
all was for an apple, an apple that he took. That moment in Adam's life, that choice that Adam made to reach for what was forbidden, he achieved what he set out to do. He took the apple, as clerkists find in written in their book. Very edified to know that the Middle English clergy were reading the Bible, were finding these stories and meditating on them, and expressing them in poetry and hymns. But this we know, although it was a bad thing to do, it was a sin, yet, in the mystery of God's providence, this choice became the source of a great blessing. So this is a theme very familiar to us from the Easter Vigil. O oh, happy fault, O oh, felix culpa, O oh, necessary sin of Adam, that won for us so great a redeemer, that Adam's choice led in a direct way to the coming of Christ, or for the prophecy of the Messiah right there in the book of Genesis after it happens thousands of years later to the incarnation, this direct line. And so this, this thought, very familiar from the medieval liturgy of the Easter Vigil, is here just uh, a little while later, uh, here at the, the uh, end of the 1300s or so, we're, 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 this is like a jazz improv on the, the themes of the Easter Vigil, as it were. Navy apple take they had the apple taken. If the apple had never been taken, how would the world be different? They had never our lady have been to heaven a queen. <coughs> if the apple had never been taken, if Adam and Eve had not been ejected from the garden for their sin, then our lady would never have become the queen of heaven. Become the mother of our Lord. Just sort of rhyming the thought of the Easter Vigil, the necessary sin of Adam that won for us so great a Redeemer. You know, a closely connected thought. Because of this, too, we have Our Lady as our Queen. Great example of that tenderness of devotion, and particularly this love for the Blessed Virgin Mary, who is always in the English mind, in particular in the English mind, in a particular English way, perhaps I'll say, Our Lady always connected to the figure of Christ the celebration of her immaculate conception uh, in liturgical history is something that manifests itself in England uh, in a strong way uh, almost before anywhere else. And so the final thought, you know, this dark, wintry thought now turning to an expression of joy. Blessed be the time that apple taken was. What a wonderful moment in human history was the taking of that forbidden fruit because it led to our redemption. Right? That we have in Christ, the Son of Mary, a greater inheritance than was possessed in the Garden of Delight. <coughs> that we share the divine nature that God took our nature to himself. And so we can say, a funny thought though it is, speaking about the first sin, blessed be the time that apple taken was, therefore we may sing Deo gratias, thanks be to God. May God in his permissive will allow this thing to occur because in his providence he planned to bring something even greater out of sin than the state of the world that preceded it when it was very good. And so th this, this kind of thought, you know, this kind of feeling runs through so much of the English expression of devotion. And so uh, the purpose of having started there in 1400 was just to set the tone, but I'll drop back chronologically to the beginning. The oldest surviving English piece of poetry, uh, Cademan's Hymn. The Venerable Bede speaks of it. Uh, so Cademan was an illiterate and unmusical cowherder, but he was miraculously empowered to sing in honor of God the Creator. The story that's come down through the centuries is that Cademan was at a, a, 
a feast. There was a wedding feast, something like that, and people are singing songs. You know, you just go around. Have you ever been in a group of friends like this where people are just, you know, singing? They, you know, have their instruments and having a good time. And Cademan is on the musical. He has no song to sing. He's sad, and he leaves dejected. He goes home and he goes to bed. And he has a dream. And in the dream, he sees a man who tells him to sing. And he says, I have nothing to sing. And the man says, sing of the creation of the world. And then in the dream, Cadman begins to sing this beautiful song. He never knew the lyrics before. He never knew the tune before. But he's singing this, this song that he learned, and that it was given in the dream. And he wakes up, and the song is in his mind. And he goes to a, a local abbess tells her about this experience of the dream, and she encourages him to, to sing this song, to make known this song in praise of God the Creator. And so Kidman translated into poetry the truths of the scripture, and it, it apparently was um, was quite popular, and it came down uh, in numerous manuscripts that have survived. You know, most most stuff that happens is lost to history, uh, but this poem affected so many people that it was it was written down, and so uh, in old English. So we see that's not Latin there in the image, but um, but it's a uh, an attempt to write down this this old English poem, which, which exists in. The, several forms. So this is from the early 11th uh, century. And uh, Bede, in his, in his writings, gives the text not in its original Old English, but in Latin. Bede is writing in Latin, so he gives a translation of it. But after translating into Latin and recording uh, this, this poem, he remarks, Hic est sensus. This is the sense of it. But not the order of the words which he sang as he slept. For it is not possible to translate verse, however well composed, literally from one language to another, without some loss of beauty and dignity. The burden of the translator in every age is, is to realize this, that you can't capture the poetry of an original language. Uh, but having said that, uh, this is the idea that Cateman is singing about. Now we shall honor Heaven Kingdom's ward, the measurer's might and his mind plans, the work of the glory father, as he of each wonder, eternal Lord, the origin established. He first created for the children of men heaven for a roof, holy shaper, then middle earth mankind's ward, Eternal Lord, after created the lands for men, Lord Almighty. So he's singing to the honor of God, the Creator, as he was told in the dream. Bede, in his writing, also introduces us to another musical figure, James, a deacon of York, who, quote, because he was such an expert in singing in church, brought peace once again to the province and increase the numbers of the faithful. And also, as a master of the church, many singers after the customs of Rome and Canterbury began to exist. Speed records that singers in the tradition of Rome and Canterbury, which is the same tradition, uh, populate the English church. In our first talk, we, we heard mentioned some uh, synods that were held in the seventh century the gathering of peoples in England to discuss matters of the life of the church. The 664 Synod of Whitby established the date of Easter, which is a very important thing to uh, calculate correctly, and also established that the liturgy that was to be used in, in this island was to be the liturgy as used in Rome. And a, a brief aside on the history of liturgy, uh, Rome in the so-called Dark Ages, and there was much that was dark about them, uh, Rome in the centuries, in the latter half of the first millennium, had no uh, political authority to impose a liturgy, even if the Pope had wished to do so. 
which very often the Pope did not. He was uh, very free in letting things exist. But, uh, but the Roman liturgy, the Roman Missal, spread organically and naturally all throughout Europe, even to the near extinction of many other local expressions of the Mass, because, I think in large part, because the chants, the Gregorian chants that went with the texts suggested for each week of the year in the Roman scheme, the chants were so beautiful that everybody everywhere in Europe said, well, let's do that. You know, even if they had, had other traditions that you know, go way, way back, uh, that these other expressions of the liturgy in the Middle Ages uh, die out. The, the Mozarabic rite in Spain is almost gone in the year 1500. Uh, it, it, it's sort of kept alive as an endangered species by the intentional intervention of, of, of Bishop Jared. So uh, the Roman way of praying the Mass and especially singing the Mass becomes universal in Europe uh, by a slow progression of people opting in. We, we heard some of the work done in the court of Charlemagne that helped that to happen. But the method of singing that came from Rome is the method of praying the Mass in England. Uh, this is reiterated a century later, in 747, at a council which decreed that all the most sacred festivals of our Lord in the method of chanting shall be celebrated in one and the same way, namely, according to that sample which we have received in writing from the Roman Church. And so the chant tradition that comes from Rome evolves in England uh, and, and expresses itself in a in an increasingly English way, but that's, that's the root of uh, the music that's being sung. Uh, here is a uh, motet. Um, my, my slide got a little reformatted from computer to computer, so I think some of it's cut off. But um, this is uh, the 13th century, question mark, maybe earlier, a uh, motet from the Worcester Cathedral. And uh, there's a, a more modern English rendering on the right, but uh, the, the sense of the left, uh, the, the original text from the 1200s or so, I think, I think you'll be able to, uh, to hear. Jesu Christus Mildemar stood beheld here a son, a rod, that he was a pin So the, the, the mild, the sweet, meek mother of Jesus Christ beheld her son on the rood, this medieval English word for the cross, right? A, a rod, a beam, a wood, the rood. She beheld her son pinned to the rood beam, pinned to the cross. The sun hung, the mother stood, and beheld her a child's blood with a, of his wound is run. She, she's seeing the blood running from the wounds of her son. New a bliss he has brought that mankind so dear a bought, and for us death <coughs> is dear a life. <coughs> he brought us new bliss, he that bought mankind so dearly. <coughs> he gave his own dear life for us. Glad and life though us make for the sweetest son's sake, O oh, the maiden blissful wife. <coughs> thou makest us glad and blithe for thy sweet son's sake. Be thou blissful, virgin wife. So again, this, this tenderness to the Blessed Virgin Mary, this, this ever-present aid in our meditation on the person of Christ, his, his sweet mother. Cut off here on my slide, but the, the last line of uh, this motet. Bring us, mother, to this one, make us ever with him one, that us bought with this blood. So plead to the Blessed Virgin to bring us, O oh mother, to this one, to Christ, and make us ever with him one. Make us bought us with his blood. Make us ever one with the one who bought us with his blood. Very, very common medieval themes of devotion is meditation at the foot of the cross.
Now, we are transitioning in this period of history from the style of poetry of the first millennium, which is unrhymed. Uh, the, 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 there's tricks of alliteration or stress that, that give the poetic cadence. Um, but we're entering into an era of rhyme now uh, as, we, as we go forward in time. And so the hymns and carols with which we are familiar uh, will begin to show themselves in the, the centuries that follow this period. So here is uh, an example of uh, something from the 14th century, maybe no, 15th century, this is 15th century. So in the 1400s, here is a, uh, a prayer entitled, uh, it begins, Hail Mary, full of grace, mutter in virginity. The Holy Ghost is to thee sent, from the Father omnipotent. Now is God within thee went, the angel said, Avi. When the angel Avi began, flesh and blood together ran, Mary bare both God and man, through virtue and pure dignity. <coughs> So saith the Gospel of St. John, God and man is made but one, in flesh and blood, body and bone, one God in persons three. And the prophet Jeremy told in his prophecy that the son of Mary should die for us on the road tree. Much joy to us was granted, and in earth peace was replanted, when that born was this infanta in the land of Galilee. Mary, grant to us thy bliss, where thy son his dwelling is. For what we have done amiss, pray for grace, for charity. <coughs> Amen. And we could sing this in church today, pretty much, couldn't we? And these, uh, these meditations on these biblical scenes, right? the Ave of the angel Gabriel, and how this led to the incarnation in the womb of the Virgin. Flesh and blood together ran. Mary bare both God and man. Oh, the poetry. I, I, you know, I just, I, I'm moved. I'm moved. I love these, these expressions. They're simple. You know, and the gospel is for the childlike. You know, these ideas expressed so simply in a few syllables. This appeals to the heart. This appeals to the heart and is an important part, I think, not only historically, but today, an important part of the presentation of the faith. It must be beautiful and simple and poetic if it is to move the hearts of those whose hearts it seeks to reach. One figure who spoke about this is uh, Richard Rolla of Hampel, born around 1300. Uh, oh, I'm missing a... Uh, <coughs> lost an image to, uh, to formatting here. Just a quotation I'll read for you. But um, Richard was a hermit and uh, is, is said to have performed miracles even during his life. He, he obtained a miraculous cure for someone. And his tomb was a place of pilgrimage after his death. He was never formally canonized, uh, but certainly there was a great devotion to him as a saint on a local level. And his influence continued to be felt throughout the centuries. One of Robert Q. Benson's very first publications after his ordination as a Catholic priest was his translation of Rolla's A Book of the Love of Jesus, which Benson published in 1905, updated into modern English in 1905. And so um, uh, Richard, our hermit friend, says this about the role of music in, in the spiritual life. I'll explain one word here. Uh, ghostly, good adjective means spiritual, right? The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, these are synonyms. So. Great abundance of ghostly comfort and joy in God comes in the hearts of them as says or sings devoutly the Psalms. This scripture is called the Book of Hymns of Christ. Hymn is loving of God with song. What is a hymn? What are we doing here? We're loving God with song. I like this idea. And uh, Richard says that three things follow from the singing of a hymn. Loving of God. 
joining of heart and thought, effectuous thanking of God's love. Song is a great gladness of thought. Well, Francis speaks about the joy of the gospel. That, that, that when we present the faith, it should be joyous. And so, great gladness of thought is another way of saying song. Right? And if we have this great gladness, then we sing about it. About the things that we uh, are joyful about. We sing. Uh, Richard Rohl translated the Psalms and many other passages of Scripture into English. And again, his years, about 1500 to 1349. And so uh, there was a, uh, a myth, in a bad sense, a falsehood, an incorrect historical narrative that would have it that it was the Protestants or perhaps some sort of proto-Protestant heretics who first translated the scripture into English. But uh, certainly, that is, that is not the case. So we saw earlier a uh, sort of, uh, what was the word Ted used, enculturation <coughs> of the gospel story already in, in uh, other vulgar tongues. Uh, but even specifically, you know, close intentional translations of the scriptures, we see these in the Middle Ages in the English language. In addition to the translation of the scriptures into English, the 14th century saw the translation of hymns into English. So that, that slide uh, that I began with, with the interlinear Latin, and then the English word for each Latin word written atop it. Uh, now we begin to see fuller, specifically beautifully, poetically English translations <coughs> of, of hymns. Um, the Franciscans, in particular, are the originators of what we might recognize as our tradition of English hymnody or carols. Um, the the yes, God's minstrels, they're, they're called. The earliest religious carols were from the Franciscan work in England. One scholar posits that before 1350, the existence of the popular short verse genre in England is a peculiar phenomenon of the Franciscan spirituality. Other scholars will, will say that they share that with the Dominicans and others who were doing similar uh, missions, revitalizing the faith. But we do owe a great debt to the Franciscans in this particular regard, for sure. So hymnody, uh, rhyme, as we would recognize it today, is beginning to emerge in the English language. And if I were to ask you a poll, who is the greatest writer of hymns in the history of the English language? I expect that I would get names like Isaac Watts, Charles Wesley, uh, but my vote is for William Herbert, uh, whom you've all heard of now. And so <laughs> this is going to be great. Um, this guy that uh, you've never heard of, he was a, a, a lecturer at Oxford. Um, he died in 1333. And he translated hymns in Anglicum into English. Non semper de verbo ad verbum. Not always word for word, said Frequenter senso, but frequently the sense of the original Latin is what's being translated. And so because it's capturing the sense, it's able to communicate the same faith. And so some examples from Herbert's work. Vexilla Regis Proteus. Uh, J.M. Neal translated this Latin into a more modern English as the Royal Banner's Forward Go, uh, a, a, a Holy Week hymn. Uh, I've got here uh, in the upper left the uh, Latin. This is the fifth verse, just an example. Uh, the Latin original, uh, Neil's modern English translation, and then Herbert's in the lower left with uh, just modernizing that, that English a bit more so we can uh, understand it more easily. And so the, the sense of the, the Latin here, uh, beata, blessed whose branches, on whose branches hung Pretium, sacredly, the price of the world. So this is a meditation on the cross, bearing the body of Christ, the, the work of our redemption. And uh, Herbert, capturing the sense of this, says, Blessed be thou, 
that habest to barn, the worldless ransom that was forlorn. Thou art to make it Christ his way. Through thee he took a hell of prey. Uh, you, you, are, you are made, he's singing to the cross, you are made Christ's way, his scale, his balances, this image of the cross weighing the value of the life of Christ against the redemption of the whole world. It's, it's an image that's not quite in the medieval Latin original. This is from like 600s, this Latin hymn. Well, the world is hanging on the cross, or the, the world's redemption is hanging on the cross. But, but William sees this as, as a, a pair of scales. The cross is a pair of scales. And so this for me is a good example of what this medieval English work of translation is doing. It's, it's capturing something true and poetic and beautiful about the faith. But it's not exactly, you know, it's not a literal translation, word for word, of what comes before it. But it's capturing the sense, and therefore it's communicating beautifully what's happening on the cross. That through thee, right, O blessed cross, he took from hell its prey, rescuing from hell all those who had died, awaiting redemption. Uh, here's Herbert's translation of the Ave Maris Stella, it's the great Latin antiphon to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Hail Libide, sea star at bright, goddess mother, airy white, made in ever, verse and light, of heaven rank, seal again. <clears throat> like Ave that thou bongens spell, of the Angelus mouth called Gabriel, in grit was set, and shield from sham, that turns the backward, Ava's now. Is a, the, the Ave reverses the name Eva, right? E-V-A, Eve, you know, who ate the apple, is turned around, Ave, in the words that Gabriel says to Mary. Um, but this, uh, this, this, this sense in, in Greek, of set, in peace of set, the, uh, the Greek is the, uh, what kind of peace is that? That's the, 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 the truce or the treaty after the, the terrorists and peoples of the seas are finished their conquests. They make a truce, a peace, in grit a set. We are set in the peace that is won by the victory of Christ. Give demons a bond unbind. Bring light to them that beeth blind. Put from us our sin and earn us our win. Show that thou art mother one, and he for the tech our bond, that for us thy child become, and of thee our condenom. <coughs> Maid one, thou were with child among ours so mild, of sin us quit on haste, and make us meek and chaste. And if thou give us clean, we seek our garden and lane, that we, Jesus, the see, and ever like to be. To Father Christ and Holy Ghost, be of thunk and carrying, and to three all persons, and all God, all menske and worshipping. You can kind of hear, even, right, we don't speak Middle English, but the resonances are close enough where I can be moved by this, by this expression. Okay, one final example from the writings of uh, this, this author, the translations of this author, uh, a sort of meditation on Isaiah 63, uh, which is a, a text that comes up in, in, in the, the breviary frequently. And so there's uh, a dialogue between the angels and Christ, and Christ, common medieval image, arrayed for battle against the devil. What is he, this lordling, that cometh from the fight with blood red wed, so gristly dight, so fair a countenance, so seemly in sight, so Stiflich younger, so doughty a knight. 
Christ imagined as a, a young lord who comes to list in, in, in battle, in the joust, and his clothes are blood red. He is, he is in this grisly way arrayed from his battle. And yet he has so fair a countenance. He is beautiful to behold even covered in blood. He's a valiant knight. I'm going to turn aside from hymns and look at, uh, just have two more texts, just two final texts for our consideration this morning. Um, not a hymn, but a poem, a very famous poem, The Vision of Piers Plowman by William Langdon. <coughs> Perhaps the greatest piece of English poetry before Chaucer. Many people, I'm sure, would subscribe to that. Um, there's a beautiful passage about the harrowing of hell here in this text, Piers Plowman, where, uh, so we, without this text, I don't think we would ever have Paradise Lost by Milton or in the screw tape letters. There's conversations of the demons among themselves. So this genre begins to take shape uh, here in the, in the Middle Ages. And so here is what's happening to set the scene here for this, this excerpt. Christ has just died on the cross, and he is descending into hell, and so suddenly, very unusually for hell, there appears a bright light. There is a light shining in the darkness of hell itself, and the various demons are wondering what is going on, and Lucifer knows, and so this is Lucifer speaking. And so you have the more modernized uh, English on the, on the right there. Listen, O Lucifer, for this Lord I know. Both this Lord and this light, it's long ago I knew him. May no death, this Lord dear, may no devil's uh, quaintness. And where he walk is his way, acquire him of the perils. If he reave me of my right, he robbeth me by mystery. For by right and by reason, the ranks that been here, body and soul be mine, both good and ill. For himself has said it, that sire is of heaven, that if Adam enter the apple, all of should die, and dwell in Deo with us devils. This threatening he made. And said that he that soothness is said to these words. And I said then issued seven thousand winter. I live that law need not let him the least. So okay, what is Lucifer speaking about to the other devils? Okay, I know who this is. I know this light that's shining that's coming down. And the devils are wondering, you know, will he reave me of my right? Lucifer says, I have the right to all the souls that are here in hell, both the good and the bad. Not only the sinners, but even the righteous. Because he himself, the Lord of heaven, who is truth, said, on the day that you eat of the apple, you will surely die. Right? That Adam and all his descendants, therefore, Lucifer says, belong to me by right. I have been in possession of them these 7,000 winters. And so he concludes, I believe that the law, uh, uh, reasoning about whose right it is to claim these souls, that law will support Lucifer and not this Lord, this light who is descending into hell. Well, uh, Christ's coming then occurs and is announced, and Christ. <coughs> Uh, weighs in on this argument about who should own these souls of all who have ever lived. Dukes of this dim place, anon undo these gates, that Christ may come in, the King is Son of Heaven. And with that breath, hell a break, with bellius as far as. For any way or word, why open the gates? Patriarchus and the prophets, Populus and Tenebris, 
So in St. Jonas song, Echi Agnus Dei. Lucifer, look in might, so light him a blend. And go that our Lord loved it, into his light he laughed, it, and said it to Satan, Lo, hear my soul to an endless for all a sinful souls. To save those that have been worthy. Mine they been, and of me. I may the best him claim. Although reason record and write of myself that if they ate of the apple, all should die. I behind him not ere hell forever. For the deed that they did, thy deceit it made. With guile thou him get. Again, all the rest. For in my palace paradise, in persona of an adder, falsely thou fettest there thine that I loved. Thus, like a lizard with a lady visage, thiefly thou me robbest, the old law granteth that givers be beguiled. And that is good reason. Dentem pro dente et opium <coughs> pro opolo. Tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye. Ergo, sola shall sola <coughs> quit, and sinna to sinna wend. And all that man hath misdo, I, man, hola amend it. This is Christ's answer to Lucifer. Okay, you say you own them because of this sin. Wow, and this is a this is a legal argument. Well, no, you tricked them by your guile, the lie that you spoke to Eve. And so you don't have a better legal claim to them. And a second argument, you know, besides this robbery. Okay, the old law right, that you're claiming, right? What was said in the Old Testament, that's what Lucifer is claiming, gives him right to the souls. Well, the old law is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so, soul for soul. And man sinned? Christ says, I, man, died. St. Paul says he became sin for us. I became sin to redeem those who sinned. I became man to redeem man. I, who am body and soul, suffer the separation of body and soul on the cross and so redeem the souls that are in hell and make amends for all that was ever misdone. Just get chills. Just get chills, you know, reading this Middle English poetry. So thus far, the Middle Ages, and if any of this stirs your heart, right, if any of this speaks to you in, in your soul, the whole purpose of the exercise of looking at this text is for me to suggest that we should be doing the same. That we should be singing beautiful songs, <coughs> writing poetry, even if we're unmusical cowherders. And God will allow us to express the beauty of our faith to others. Uh, not only in arguments, but in, in the beauty of poetry. Okay, one final text, one final figure, who perhaps uh, demonstrates that this is possible in our day, is Father Faber. Father Faber, uh, who was a contemporary of Newman, uh, another of the famous, you know, that era of converts, and Newman said of Faber that he was worthy of all consideration without equals at the present time. In particular, Newman uh, contrasts his own poetry, Lead Kindly Light. Newman contrasts his own poetry with some of the, the hymns of Faber, specifically about heaven. And Newman said that, that uh, my poem was written by one who desires to see heaven. Faber's hymns were written by one who has seen it. Faber captured many people with the eloquence of, of his, his poetry. We know many of his hymns, Faith of Our Father. Faith of our fathers, sweet sacrament we the adore. Right, we know these, these hymns of favor that are, that are coming. Um, you may or may not know this, this example, but um, oh, I'm a little cut off on my slide, but uh, this, this will be my, my closing uh, 
meditation for us today. And again, the, the, the purpose of this meditation that I'll leave us with, we're once again at the foot of the cross, we're with the Blessed Virgin Mary, considering what our Lord did to redeem us. I'll just read this as my conclusion here. And if this moves us, then it will move others. And I think it will be an important part, poetry, hymnody, rhyme. It will be an important part of our presentation of the faith in the work of evangelization. O come and mourn with me a while. See, Mary calls us to her side. O come and let us mourn with her. Jesus, our love, is crucified. Have we no tears to shed for him? All soldiers scoff and Jews deride. Ah, look how patiently he hangs. Jesus, our love, is crucified. How fast his hands and feet are nailed. His blessed tongue with thirst is tied. His failing eyes are blind with blood. Jesus, our love, is crucified. His mother cannot reach his face. She stands in helplessness beside. Her heart is martyred with her sons. Jesus, our love, is crucified. Seven times he spoke seven words of love, and all three hours his silence cried for mercy on the souls of men. Jesus, our love, is crucified. What was thy crime, my dearest Lord? By earth, by heaven, thou hast been tried, and guilty found of too much love. Jesus, our love, is crucified. Found guilty of excess of love, it was thine own sweet will that tied thee tighter far than helpless nails. Jesus, our love, is crucified. Death came and Jesus meekly bowed. His failing eyes he strove to guide with mindful love to Mary's face. Jesus, our love, is crucified. O oh, break, O oh, break, hard heart of mine, thy weak self-love and guilty pride, his Pilate and his Judas were. Jesus, our love, is crucified. Come take thy stand beneath the cross, and let the blood from out that side fall gently on thee, drop by drop. Jesus, our love, is crucified. A broken heart, a fount of tears, ask and they will not be denied. A broken heart, love's cradle is. Jesus, our love, is crucified. O love of God, O sin of man, in this dread act your strength is tried, and victory remains in love. Jesus, our love, is crucified.